So how did you get into somatics and what yeah. part of somatics? Because this is sort of a broad word I'm, at this point. It is. It's like a big umbrella term. I know. Yeah. So I grew up with a family that was very body oriented. So my mom was always doing yoga. I had an aunt that was a massage therapist. At the same time, I have a lot of uh, childhood trauma, developmental trauma. Um, and there was something about that combination where it was like, yes, I was experiencing uh, a lot of the effects of trauma, but always had this relationship with my body, specifically a reverence for the female body that I, I didn't quite see my friends growing up with, um, that always kind of directed me towards seeing the body as the main source of, uh, well, a lot of things, right, as the main source of what's driving our experience of life. Um, so I danced for a long time. Um, and that was a huge outlet for me, especially with childhood trauma um, and like really expressing and feeling my feelings. Um, and then right after college, I had this, I had I didn't know anything about polyvagal theory yet, but I told my friend, I really want to write a book about how our body is actually driving like the issues that we have, like our, our body actually is driving that. I somehow intuitively knew that. Um, and my friend at the time was like, yeah, okay, you go write that book. And then sure enough, you know, after years and years of teaching yoga, I stumbled upon, you know, Peter Levine's work, uh, Dr. Stephen Porges's work. And it felt like everything that I had intuitively felt was being validated. Um, so it, it all came really intuitively to me. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question. No, but I mean, that, that would make sense, right? So if like, if this is a, if this is kind of just like, um, a truism or a universal, I guess. So if the body has certain ways of behaving and then Levine's work and you would read it and then it would make sense. So it was like, well, that seems to be what they're saying anyways. Yeah, exactly. It just, it felt like, um, my instincts were, you know, being reflected back via, more science, more scientific lens. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of happening a lot with, I'm sure you see it with your work in martial arts and, um, Tibetan Buddhism, you said mm -hmm. it's like a lot of, a lot of people are, are finally taking seriously what indigenous people or, um, you know, like some of the ancient healing modalities already knew. Mm -hmm. Um, which is fine, but it's also like, yeah, well, we already knew this, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like we don't necessarily need science to justify. Yeah. Right. We can kind of be in the experience of it. There's still this sense of disembodiment. So right. it's like they're just throwing facts at us and there's still this idea of there's a, there's a mechanistic view. So even when we talk about the nervous system, it's just like, well, it's a system in the body. There's still this disembodied knowledge that's not there. Like how exactly. we use it. It's like, I can tell you what it does on paper, but can we do anything with it? Exactly. Like you can understand every little detail about the nervous system, but still not be in your body at all. Um, and it's really trendy. It's like a very popular topic right now to, to like know about somatics and preach about it. And <laughs> is it? The irony, it is it's oh, like, it's kind of a hot topic. Like, and which is great. I think we culturally really need this, at least in my bubble of the world it is. Um, but you see it all the time. Like people want to become somatic coaches now. And that's beautiful. But a lot of people I think are, you know, memorizing information versus actually being in the experience of it. And I think that's really where the education happens is right in the embodied awareness of of what somatics is all about and at the same time I have a lot of clients who because of trauma don't feel safe in the experience without understanding it first you know what I mean my last guest on my show on my last published episode um Elizabeth Hsu she's um has a Qigong Chinese medicine background 
but she's also an anthropologist and there's this word that she was using in her paper that I'd never heard before it's called enskillment hmm. it's an anthropological term and it, essentially it means like the learning happens within the practice it's not happening in the books or, or hearing it's it's when you're actually in the embodied practice so in our case it would be like a tai chi practice so you know you you do the tai chi practice and during that embodied experience experience certain things come to the fore and that's the learning process and that's the only way that certain things can be learned essentially the first person embodied perspective yeah that's beautiful and i think what was the word again in skillment yeah in skillment it's a wonderful yeah. world word but it's just in this one discipline i think so we got to bring it out into the totally at a community uh -huh. Yeah, I think that a lot of people could benefit from learning some enskillment for sure. It's it's um it's hard to take the hypervigilance behind trauma and try to invite people into going slower and being in their body. So like the information overload I think oftentimes is like matching the imprint of trauma which is like it's hypervigilance. It's, I need, I need it all right now. And I need to know it all right now versus let's go slow and actually feel. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a, that's interesting. So, okay. So let's, let's deconstruct for a minute or unpack this a little bit. So when we say being in the body, mm -hmm. what do we mean? Or what do you mean by that? Oh, I love this question. Uh, to me, there's a conscious, awareness not just in our mind but there's like a vast deep intelligence throughout our whole body a consciousness um, so one simple example for people who are listening is like just move move your hand a little bit like wiggle your fingers around for a little bit and you can really move them however you want you can maybe squeeze your hand a little bit and then release a few times and then pause and notice what you feel in your hand perhaps versus the other hand so I feel more blood flow there's more tingles more sensation in my hand versus the other hand after moving and to me this is just a small example of what it means to be in your body right um, cause that is a term that gets thrown on, around a lot, I think. And it's like, what do you mean? I'm in my, I am in my body. Like I walk around <laughs> every day, but, but it's the felt sense experience as Eugene Jenlin says of ourselves in our, in our body. Yeah. Yeah. Felt sense. That's, that's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have to give people a, a foothold. So if somebody's disembodied, like, I like what you say, it's like, there's no really you can't be disembodied you're in the body so when we say this we have to be more clear what we're talking about so the felt experience I like that um and some of my guests on well from personal teachers but then also some of my guests from uh with, in the Chinese arts that sensation feeling that being able to just feel in the body um that is what they mean when they talk chi like that's all it really is. It's just like feeling the sensation in the body. See, we immediately go to, well, this blood flow, it's this, it's that, and the other. And that's beginning the disembodied process again because we start to cognize the experience. But staying within that felt sensation of the body and then being able to work with it. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. are you familiar with Feldenkrais? Do you do Feldenkrais at all? I haven't, no. So this, he was so good at this, like, getting people on their back and starting to move them around to feel that felt sensation. He was really good with that. But then um, I feel like the Western somatic practitioners, a kind of door opened into that. And then that was kind of it other than just keep paying attention to it. There wasn't a lot to do with it. Yeah. yeah, I agree. And I think that, you know, when I'm working with my clients, oftentimes they, they want to have a rational explanation for why they're feeling a sensation they're feeling. So there's this like, you know, sense of, oh, that's more blood flow. And that's not necessarily wrong, right? Like it's still, it's, it's still them getting into their body, but what we're trying to really develop an awareness of is the more spontaneous visceral sensations Versus like, oh, when I move my, 
my body, then I feel more like movement is essential to somatics for sure. Right. But what happens when you actually connect with an emotion inside and you experience that compassion or that sadness or that, you know, grief in your body, where do you feel that? And that, that tends to be, I think when I'm with my clients, I can tell there's, there's really a deepening of their, their embodiment when they can feel those more spontaneous sensations versus like, oh, when I'm stretched, I feel this or that. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, when there's a certain amount of movement, like you're saying, stretching or something, there's a bit of adrenaline most likely present. Well, when you're just sitting and being quiet, you're more open to more of the rainbow of emotions, I guess, the more. <laughs> uh, but then what do you do with them once they come? So like if somebody's having the emotion, so they're doing the somatic experiencing and they're having a positive or a negative emotion, what's the, what do we do from there? What's the instruction? Uh, yeah. So I, it, it really depends, right, um, on someone's capacity to be with a felt sense. So for some people, they might bump into a limit for how long they can be with that chi or that emotional charge in their body. So as a somatic practitioner, I've developed a really keen sense for knowing, okay, this right now is okay for this person. And I might even check in with them too, but I'm reading body language, facial expressions, tone of voice for signs of, okay, being with this activation is actually okay for them. And there's some, there's some peaks to it. And then there's some dips and it's not just charge, 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 like going up, 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 up. There's actually some rhythm to it. Um, and, you know, a lot of us have to work towards having this capacity. It's not something that we were raised with. Our parents didn't, at least my parents and people I know, weren't asked, where do you feel that emotion in your body? Like, this is fairly new, right? So we might need to develop some somatic skills that increase that capacity to be with the charge. And, you know, these days there's, it's a lot, there's a lot of like, feel your feelings, feel it to heal it. And that's all great, right? But if we don't actually know how to feel, which happens through the body, it, it might feel confusing. We might just sort of rely on our thoughts and go, oh, I'm feeling my feeling because I'm thinking and talking it out. And that's not necessarily true. Oftentimes it means you're just avoiding the feeling. That's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I agree. So yeah, that's, so that's the first step, like learning when you're embodied and when you're disembodied, strong emotion comes and you disembody to explain it. Um, so let's say, so how would you teach? So um, if there is a strong emotion, or as you say, there's a, that charges up or the, the rhythms gets moving. So you're embodied, you're experiencing the emotion, it's, it's charged. What do you do with it? Yeah. So one of the foundational parts of feeling safe with charge and activation is learning how to feel okay first, right? We have to, for a lot of people, orient to little bits of a felt sense that feels pleasant before we can go, now I can be with the charge. And so there's, you know, sometimes... Uh, a preparatory period of like, let's actually just notice what it's like to feel a positive sensation for a while and then start to move towards the charge while kind of pendulating or swinging back to that felt sense of, of what feels, I don't, I hesitate to use the word good because I think there's no good or bad really, but like what feels good for you, the warmth in your heart, the grounding in your pelvic bowl. And then that really is what gives you more. It's what shows your body that you are safe. If we just go into the activation without that, we are more likely to perpetuate cycles of, of stress and trauma versus if the body knows it's safe because you have that felt sense experience of what is pleasant, then we can move into the activation without it overwhelming us. So like we can say all the affirmations and all of the, I'm safe, I'm calm, whatever you're using. But if the body doesn't know that, 
through a felt sense of, of what feels pleasant, what feels pleasurable, you're, you're, it's going to make it really hard to feel the activation without getting overwhelmed. So the, the charge is positive and negative, or is it, it seems like you're mostly discussing it as a negative thing, like a strong negative. Um, I think it's both and it's different for everyone. And I think that it's really easy to label activation as negative when actually our body needs activation. We need to have the upregulation of like when we, you know, practice martial arts, like you've got to be able to upregulate and activate and mobilize. So there really is no good or bad. It's, it's really both. And some of us actually need to build more capacity for that. Let's, let's get going. Like I've got to get stuff done. I've got to, you know, run through the airport or whatever it is um, in order to have a more supple nervous system and more capacity. And I think there's this misconception of like, well, if you are embodied, then you're calm all the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's just not, that's, that's not what we want. We no. want to, we want to be able to respond to life. So that's the goal then to be able to be embodied and be fluid in our expression, um, being able to deal with these rhythms and charges. Is yeah. it, is it still on the passive side or do we do something active with it? Like is something being, so I know there's a time when we're going to learn to be embodied and we're, there's a listening phase. We're paying attention and we're listening. Am I safe? This is familiar. This is a new thing. And we're learning all this. But is there a time when we now take it into the activation side, like to pop consciously do, drive it in a particular direction? Yeah. So a lot of my work with women and, you know, this happens for men too, or people who are in male bodies too, but we have, because of cultural conditioning we have a tendency to freeze and fawn or go into immobilization and people pleasing versus like I need to set a boundary I need to like you said kind of activate more take up space feel that sense of agency and self-actualization and that's what embodiment gives us and before we have that embodied experience of what it's like to take up space and to set a boundary or take action, our body can become kind of defended against that process, causing us to feel small and feel like we have to constantly have a smile on our face and make others happy in order for us to be okay. So a lot of my work with, with people is actually going into the body and befriending some of the impulses that come with a healthy fight response or um, what Peter Levine calls healthy aggression. And we have a lot of, I think, cultural stigma around aggression. It's like, I'm not supposed to be aggress aggressive. Like I meditate, I'm peaceful. But the more we, we let the healthy aggression or healthy anger stay in without feeling it, the more we repress that, the more it actually comes out in weird ways towards ourselves or towards other people well yeah that's what i would think it's like because of uh emotions coming and you repress then you're just self-exploding you're just totally. beating yourself up mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. in the somatic world that i'm part of mm -hmm. how we sort of break it into two camps there's like the listening side i would put feldenkrais in that and um, even uh, hannah was sort of do you know thomas hannah's work I've heard of it, but I'm not, I've never done it. You know, we have this word somatic mm -hmm. and there's an S on it called somatics. Yeah. And that was his, Thomas was the one who coined that term yeah. in the eight. And the idea was that yeah. it means like the body experience from within. So like there's a consciousness yeah. inside the body mm -hmm. essentially. So he was really the one who created the field of somatics. He started somatic journal with Tom, uh, Tom, um, Sorry, Don Hanlon Johnson out of California. I don't know if you know him, yeah. CIS. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, he was on the show. But anyways, Tom died, but I did his program. But anyways, there's this sense of like his teacher was Moshe Feldenkrais. But then there's a, there's, so there's a sense of learning to be embodied and learning to listen. But then you have things like Alexander technique and Tom's technique, which is now we, once we listen and we're in the body, now we can direct the body from the felt experience. 
right? Yeah. So we can begin to move somatically. So meaning not driving our body through conscious thoughts, but through sensation. This is very much the Chinese arts like Tai Chi and Qigong, right? Because a lot of our athletes move dis from a disembodied state. Yeah. yeah. Right. So we have to, there's a process to do it. If we just try to move quickly and lift a lot of weight and, move, you know, play athletics, it's like you tend to become disembodied right away. Yeah. But the Chinese arts really develop the system of like, you know, when you move slow, you begin to develop that capacity. So I don't know. Is there something like this in what you do? Like is what? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've, I've taught yoga for uh, 15 years now and I know that it can be used in a way where embodiment really isn't happening. <laughs> right. Right. It's really it's like that's the most of the yoga out there. Right. Right. Yeah, now. I think so. And I, I really love to integrate the somatic lens with yoga. So we're not just practicing to do poses. We are, yeah, consciously following our body sensations and tracking them and noticing, pausing to notice like what happens in this pose not just to feel sensations, but also let's explore different channels of perception. So, you know, with, with what you're feeling inside, are there any images or emotions or impulses? And so, yeah, I, I very much um, am a movement-based practitioner. There's a lot of SEPs specifically who are doing somatics in a chair. And this, again, is it wrong for a lot of clients? That's going to be the safest way to enter into their body. So we can meet them where they're at. But if we want to, you know, really facilitate a deeper embodied experience, movement, in my opinion, is absolutely essential. Like emotion, emotions want to move. They're, you know, I'm, I don't know who came up with this, but I use it all the time. So if you know, let me know but emotions stand for energy in motion, the E and then the motion, right? And energy in motion because they are meant to drive us towards movements and impulses that our animal body, I mean, we are animals, right? Want to express, but we tend to process from this very top-down sedentary uh, way that can really create more stagnant energy in the body um and a lot of confusion as to why we don't feel better so you know there's a lot of like a lot of affirmations and a lot of mindset work and these are all beautiful but they only take us so far yeah 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 this idea of the uh somatics as movement to integrate into i think is so important because we we become so sedentary mm -hmm. And a lot of people who are sedentary, then you tell, ask them to sit in meditation. You're asking them to become more sedentary. It's like, yeah, I think sometimes we forget where these practices evolved culturally and historically. Yes. You know, a lot of these people, you know, to China, Tibet, India, like this was an agriculture society. They weren't sitting around at desks or, into, you know, so <laughs> sitting to meditate was a break in the day of their activities where they weren't even necessarily teaching exercise because their whole day was physical labor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in a lot of those cultures, there's people living well past a hundred, right? Because movement is, is so integrated into their life, even in their elderly years. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of my work centers around the pelvic bowl. Mm -hmm. And sitting is one of, I mean, that colonial invention, right, of the chair has really wreaked havoc on, on our body, but specifically um, our pelvic bowl, because we're meant to be squatting more. And when people are out in the fields squatting down, right, there's, there's a lot of health and vitality that comes from that, that act of like squatting down and getting back up, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. So interestingly china also had chairs i don't know if they invented them or not but uh you know they don't have that they still didn't have this problem they still had these other practices where it didn't become a whole sedentary lifestyle so because the ground was cold like in india you can sit and meditate in the heat <laughs> but in china and northern like tibet and stuff you don't want to be sitting on the ground meditating you have to get some get up off the ground because it's so so cold 
Yeah. So we can still have chairs, uh, but we have to figure out how to not become slaves to these things. So yeah, yeah. You, know, you know something about the pelvis. And so this is very interesting too, because obviously in, I don't, well, I don't know if you know, obviously actually, but from, from Tai Chi, Qigong, Tai, martial art background, like the, the pelvis is a big deal. Like it's like the Dan Tien. Yes. And, yeah, and Tom, Tom Hanna called it our somatic center. So there's a mm -hmm. lot going on here, but still this is not an addressed topic nearly enough. No, and I really appreciate you bringing it up because I find when I do these interviews and even in my education, there was a lot of the, the white puritanical aversion to the pelvis is it runs so deep. It's very like, that is a dirty, shameful place. And we're just going to bypass it. And there's a lot of heart centric focus in somatics. And that's beautiful. And there's that ventral branch of the vagus nerve that runs through it. And it's part of our pro-social nervous system. But if we aren't grounded in our pelvic bowls, like you brought up the Dantian, there is a lot of missed opportunity for full integration of our whole self because the pelvis is such a central uh, nexus point in the body. And it really holds so much fascia that is richly and densely packed with nerves and nerves compose our nervous system. So yeah, it's for women, our pelvis is our center of gravity. So, you know, what you said, did you say Tom Hanna said it was our somatic center? Yeah. Yeah. He talked a lot about the somatic center and he has mm -hmm. drawings and stuff around this type part of the body. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I love that. Um, and I, I think that we, we carry a lot in our pelvic bowl. So I understand that it can be a provocative place to orient to and be in. Yeah. And that's even more of a reason I think to really center it in yeah. our healing journey more. You know, and that's crazy too, because I, th I feel like even in the West though, it's like any like a power lifter, sprinter, uh, wrestler like they spend a lot of time cultivating this part of the body because it's so important and athletic so I, I I understand the disconnect among the population but actually we don't even need to look abroad any serious athlete recognizes the importance of this part of the body it's your center of mass yeah high jumping anything is like it's critical but I like what you were saying about the could you talk a little bit more about the fascia in the in the pelvic bowl yeah. So we have fascia or connective tissue all over our body. It covers everything, muscles, tissues, viscera, and the pelvic bowl holds five layers of this fascia. So more than anywhere else in the body, it's really richly and profusely filled with, with fascia. And fascia is what sheathes our nerves. So it coats our nerves. It's this living system and it very much impacts our nervous system. Um, so when the pelvic tissues, when the fascia in our pelvic bowl is restricted uh, and dehydrated because of a lack of movement, but also a lack of embodied connection, this really cuts off sensation to our pelvic bowl, but also to our whole self because those it, it's a system, right? And and with the pelvic bowl at, at our center, that really impacts our connection to our whole self if we're disconnected from this powerful space in the body. Um, and fascia, you know, is primarily made of fluids. I know it's hard to see me right now. Um, <laughs> is primarily made of fluids. And when we don't move our pelvic bowl, we're sitting a lot, right? If we're mm, cut off from our pelvic bowl because of shame and stigma and trauma, then the that really impacts the actual function of our nerves and how our nerves communicate via sensation. So through pelvic movement, um, but also somatic connection, whether it's placing your hands on your hips and breathing, um, using visuals, we can always titrate it, right? If there is a lot coming up, we can re-embody that space. And there's a lot of conversation, finally, around pelvic floor health, 
around uh, reproductive health, endocrine health, but without embodying a part of ourselves, meaning we have a felt sense awareness and connection, it's really going to be difficult to restore vitality and health in that part of our body, right? So a lot of my work centers around these deeper places within the body that um, even in the world of somatics, I just don't see a lot of orientation towards. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I think somatics is a burgeoning field, field still. There's a lot to fill in the gaps. There's a lot of gaps there still. Um, yeah. So with so you said visualization, you use visualization in your work, how? Yeah. So if, for example, we don't have much connection to our pelvic bowl for whatever reason, mm -hmm. It, we can our nervous system doesn't know the difference between what we're actually seeing and what we're imagining yeah. so we can use our imagination and you know I think there's a lot of crossover between like meditation and somatic visualization like so many times we're just using two different names for the same thing yeah, right. um, but in a somatic visualization the idea is okay when you connect to your pelvic bowl are there any colors shapes images, archetypes. Ah, I see, I see. Um, or it's, you know, let's visualize something specific to help you connect to your pelvic bowl. And there's lots of different forms of that. Maybe it's, you know, seeing a waterfall running from the crown of your head going down into the pelvic bowl and just kind of tracing that pathway. Um, so I love using visuals. It's such a, a rich and powerful channel of perception for connecting to our body yeah so there was two things right you said if we pay it if we just ask what do we see anything that's a passive listening mm -hmm. and then, there's a, then there's a there's a more like doing like oh i'm going to visualize this specific thing and make it happen i always yeah. like these two different aspects of somatics like you know are we are we listening is it a passive part of the practice or is it an actively engaged part of the practice yeah. And now I like this too. It's like, you think about the body, you know, if you tell somebody, oh, visualize your pelvic bowl, right? visualize your tailbone, even something simple, like visualize your tailbone, uh, your sacrum. Um, it's like, well, that's not your sacrum. Any visualization you have of your sacrum, you've never seen your sacrum. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're doing, it's an image from a skeleton or a book or uh -huh. something you picked up and now you're, that's a visualization. Even totally. if it's close to what you think your anatomy looks like it's still a visualization. Um, and I think also this can, so let me tell, sort of say this, and then you, if you have any th sort of yeah. thoughts on this. Um, so in the Chinese or Tibetan models, we were working with like channels, you know, this, a subtle body, what's called a subtle body. So you, you know, you dissect the body, you're not going to find it. Um, but for me, it's, I've, I've found the practices is working with the subtle body is much easier to embody than when I work with Western anatomy mm -hmm. body because it's a it's a very you know it's um it's a me mechanistic yes thing. and it sends me right back to a conceptual framework that takes me right back to a disembodied state where if I can stay in the fluid you know working with the, the channels and more like a water imagery that's much more easy to feel like I can run my hand through a pool or a tub or a lake and then tap into that in my practice much more than I can a bone yeah. or a dried out, you know, body that's used for like dissection or something. You know, I, I, I can't really relate to that somatically. There's no sensation there. I agree. Yeah. I think it also really pushes this idea of isolating certain body parts when there perhaps is pain or dysfunction, right. it's like, let's just target that right where the pain is. That's right. Versus like, let's look at the whole system. So I have people I've worked with who've had back pain for years, jaw pain for years. When we work actually with the pelvic bowl, that really is such a source of, and this is backed by research, but like such a source in the body of a lot of the pain or discomfort, even in our shoulders, right? Um, so I think that you're right. I think it's what you said about it being mechanistic and also this Western uh, 
cultural framework of let's go into the body and just look at what's going wrong and try to just fix that versus let's look at the whole system, the whole person as a person, uh, instead of just like chasing symptoms. What well, I mean, that makes so much sense on so many levels. Like, uh, so for one, like if you have something wrong in the shoulder, but it's really coming from the pelvis, I mean, that makes sense. It's like if your orientation isn't right in gravity, then you're mm-hmm. going to have to adopt a compensatory pattern to stay upright up top somewhere. It's like this is it's even from a mechanistic model, this is makes sense. But but then two, what I like about the fascia and the nervous system is yeah. we really are moving from a direct uh, space of mechanistic to, you know, more water, full body connection. You know, it's not really material, it's viscous, it's kind of material, but then it's, you know, when you, like, again, if you do a dissection, it's not really there any longer because it's water. It loses its shape, but it's like in the living body, this is what constitutes movement. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and connecting with our fluid nature is something we're not really encouraged to do, right? Right. It's, everything's very linear. It's very, you know, go, go forward. There's no ebb and flow. There's no rhythm. And rhythm is, in my opinion, and not just my opinion, lots of other people, like this idea of pendulation is so crucial to our psycho-emotional, mental, and physical health. Yeah. Um, so looking at cycles within the body and how everything really functions within that cycle is massive. Yeah. No, no, I love what you say. And all organic material, like we're in the autumn right now. It's like there's a whole cycle. There's a rhythm to mm-hmm. life. Uh, breaking everything down mechanistically and just look, you know, taking a car, car apart. There's no real rhythm when it's just laying there. But it's like life has rhythm. So it's yeah. a common sense thing. Do you see this changing? Or do you think we're, the old model was so in so stuck we're not ever going to go forward because it seems like there's there's movement forward here I think so you know and I'm you know in my little my little bubble where I teach this so I see it in my clients and I see it in my students um so I think we're on our way and it's it might take time but there is finally some orientation to what yeah a lot of more indigenous practices um, or ancient practices have, you know, carried that wisdom for so long. And there's something, you know, I think interesting and frustrating about the fact that like now that these white intellectual men are proving that this is real now, all of a sudden we're finally paying attention, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I don't, I, so I'm working from the, I'm working East West in a lot of my work like I came to somatics late yeah but it's helping me explain a lot of the practices that I learned in the east from different traditions yeah and you know some people need that explanation to feel safe with it and so it's fine and I I teach polyvagal theory like I don't have anything against these more scientific based um lenses but my work has always from a pretty young age been um the integration of science with, with spirit, with, you know, like when we talk about our spirit or our soul, whatever you want to call it, like, I really see that as the body itself. And like, we don't need to be separate to be like my, my tissues, my muscles, my everything that is, that is soul. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I just, I like the, I like the somatic conversation. I think that it's bringing so I think it's a global conversation. I think it's bringing so many different views and opinions or traditions to the table, not necessarily opinions, but traditions to the table. And Mm -hmm. I I think a common language is is happening now. I think just by conversations like this, I think things are, you know, whatever's happening in China and Tibet, I think there's obviously crossover and similarities. We're all human beings and it's all working from an embodied point of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, find it fascinating that I can sit down with you and be right on the same page even though our practices are probably very different on the outside but internally I think they're probably much more in common than different oh totally yeah yeah Yeah, I agree and I think that this is a 
a conversation we've needed to have we needed to have a long time ago but it's it's finally taking off and um and I think there's a reason that the term somatic somatics is such an umbrella term because yeah at the core connecting to our bodies is this universal experience and it's really our first experience of ourselves so like with my work in in birth work if we look at gestation right our first experience of ourselves is in the womb and it's not this intellectual you know I am Veronica I am a mother whatever it's it's I have a hand (laughs) it's I can feel my face or I can move in this fluid. And that really is our first experience of life is, is embodiment. So this isn't like a, a trend. This is, this is a remembering, like we, we hold this memory of ourselves and our first knowing of ourselves. That's not really a word, but we're going, we're going to go with it. Our first knowing of ourselves is, is our body. yeah no I think that's good I like that knowing of ourselves I've had moments like that where I would be in practice or something I was like this is the most me I've ever felt it just dawns on you know it's not an intellectual knowing it's just a this is it this is the thing Mm -hmm. yeah it's an experience yeah yeah and like you said so the embryological thing is interesting too because again in China and Tibet that's the that's a big thing you don't even really go forward with some advanced practices until you fundamentally understand embryology well yeah i mean it's just touching like what you said it's the essence of our embodied state and again we're in water there's a fluid mm-hmm. there there's a there's a, f- a mobility there it's it's wonderful actually yeah it's it's really uh beautiful thinking about how in in the womb we were just being and we had all of our uh, all of our needs being met without us having to try we just got to be like effortless little beings floating in an amniotic sea and so much of my work is helping people to remember how to just be and still have all your needs met to receive right and when we're in our bodies that that happens so much easier like I really believe the body holds an inherent pathway to healing uh if we, if we just allow ourselves to be in it, but it's not so easy, right. For some people to get there. So that's where people like you and I, I guess, come in. Well, I think it's the societal thing. Like you yeah. have to have time. Like if you're at a job, it's like, nobody's paying you to be embodied. No. <laughs> keep thinking this, it's like, you know, we have many best and bright minds, but where's the avenue of a, of a, of a living. If you follow the somatic path forward. Yeah. yeah. Um, right no we're we're not being paid to be embodied and I will say that you know my life really didn't take off until my body was centered in in my work and you know there's even some like geniuses like Albert Einstein there's um quotes of him saying that some of his best work came came through sensations in his body he was experiencing a sensation and then all of a sudden he, you know, had one of those light bulb moments. So we find that in a lot of artists. I think it's a must Mm -hmm. all all the creative process. We can't, it's not a nine to five. It's more because you got to get in touch with this other bit. But again, it's like where you got to be in a, in a place that's conducive for that type of type of learning to take place. Right. If you're, I don't know if you're familiar, but initially when the, um, I don't know initially, but uh, in India, the idea of going into a retreat was was called you returning to the womb. Mm. Go into a space, you'd be all by yourself, but all your needs were met. People would bring you food and, you know, wow. you interact with them. They would just bring things to you, but all your needs were met. It was a time of gestation. It's a time of like for you to develop. Oh, I love this. Yeah, that's what retreats really meant, but I think without knowing that you can easily go into retreat and just think 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 yes not have an embodied experience at all right but, but yeah. that's the point yeah I love I love leading retreats and I'm like nerding out so hard right now because <laughs> uh you know a lot of my work is centered around the womb and so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna like 
sit with that and like really let it in because it's so true. Even as a facilitator of retreats, I leave with this sense of like effortlessness. Um, and I'm working, I'm working pretty hard on retreats, right? But when you, when you really facilitate it in a way where people can have that more embodied experience, um, yeah, there is that element of like, you just get to receive, like you're going to, you're going to do yoga and do somatics and people are going to cook for you and they're going to, yeah, um, make it really cozy. And I think there's this sense of like, oh, retreats are just this luxurious, like, oh, that's an extra thing that you do for yourself when actually it's been essential to so many people's healing journey, like including my own. Um, yeah. We well, brought up somebody like Einstein, but any sort of person doing that kind of deep contemplative work, usually they're undisturbed in their office and it becomes, it's their own retreat or musician where they're just yes. hours and hours. Like Alexander, the Alexander technique, I think he was like three months in front of a mirror, just standing there by himself every day, observing his posture. Wow. Yeah. Or like Feldenkrais, you know, he was injured really bad. So he's in a hospital bed and forced into a kind of retreat. You, you, I mean, most of these people are in some sort of circumstance that puts them in isolation and they're working on something alone day after day. And it sort of builds a kind of momentum comes until something pops. Yeah. Yeah. So fascinating. And at the same time, I think that when you're in your body, you know, you're, you're really connecting with the collective too. You're really in tune with like how co-regulation is happening, even when you're not with other people or animals. So there's that kind of, um, universal experience in it too. Well, that, and that was the thing, you know, a lot of Tai Chi masters are in the retreat. Most of these are done in nature. So you're connecting mm -hmm. to nature. That's a massive part of the practice. And then also you're not meant to stay in retreat forever. Once you attain this, you come out and now yes. your body is your re retreat right. all the time. You're always in a kind of retreat because you're in a deep embodied space, but you're also conversely connecting. It's not an isolated thing where you just go inward and shut down. Yeah. It's usually learning how to be somatically inclined and then being able to reemerge re back into the world and function, but maintain your embodied state. So this internal external thing is happening right. all the time but it's in balance now you've understood the body mind situation yeah and for a long time I could go inward and it was wonderful and I loved it and it was so cozy right but if you bring me into a room with people and bright lights I was out of my body I just was you know and not in a bad way but just like okay well now I can't it's hard for me to feel myself um so I think, yeah, embodiment is this like weaving together of that internal and external. So there is rhythm there. It's like when I'm with people, I am also feeling sensations and how my body is reacting. And it's so easy, I think, to project what we're holding onto inside onto the external without an awareness. And then all of a sudden, you're just kind of spewing stuff out that's not really coherent with what's happening, right? But if I have this awareness of my inner world, when I orient to the external, to other people, to my environment, I can go, okay, I'm having this reaction. Does it, is it really coherent with what's happening? Or am I, is my body just remembering something from a long time ago that happened and is trying to protect me from it? Yeah. Why well, I, I love that. And I think what you're saying too is essentially you you've learned to listen. It's an art of listening. Yeah. You're listening to your body, you're listening to the external situation, and then they're able to adapt into the rhythm, as you keep saying, which I also really like this idea of rhythm. Yeah. Most people aren't listening. They're mm -mm. Listening constantly. Right. Yeah. There was a the story I love when the Dalai Lama, this lady met the Dalai Lama, and she was like, I always you know, I thought he was going to have some big sort of power. She was going to mm -hmm. have a mystical experience being in the same room as him. And she came out and they, somebody asked her and she was like, you know what it was? It was that I've never been with somebody that listened to me that well. Like wow. he was completely present. And I felt like the only person in the world and he was just so attunedly mm -hmm. listening to me. And then you realize, yeah, we don't listen. 
we're not paying attention. Like we wouldn't be doing what we're doing to the planet if we listened. Yeah. The complete yeah. cut off from, we, we're not listening to the tree just to go out and cut a tree down carelessly. It's like, well, you haven't listened. You don't realize how connected you are to that tree and how dependent upon that tree you are. You cut it down like it's a something you buy, a piece of plastic you buy in a store. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that attunement is so huge and it's such a huge part of how we feel safe in the world from a really young age. And if we weren't attuned to the way our caregivers, you know, needed to, it can show up in our ability to attune to others, to be in relationship and feel safe. And, and yeah, it's, everything is a relationship. So like talking about the tree, about nature, right. Um, Or even like the work we do in the world, it's all a relationship. And I think our body really holds our relationship to being in relationship. So if there's misattunement with ourselves, it's likely going to be, you know, misattuned to our environment as well. Well, thank you so much. Is there anything else? Um, No, just thanks so much. This was wonderful.